All right, so in this video, we're going to be talking about examples of how free energy changes. Um, either a positive change in free energy, where energy is being stored, or a negative change in free energy, where energy is being released, um, can be used in living things, in some actual biological examples. So right here, we've got a cell membrane. This is the cell membrane right there. It separates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. So this is the outside of the cell, also known as the extracellular fluid. And down here, you've got the inside of the cell. These purple objects are proteins inside the cell. And then all these little things right here, whether they're the black circles or these um, blue squares, these are solutes. Um, solutes are anything that's dissolved in something else. Um, usually that's going to be water, but it could be anything. And you can see that what's happening is these solutes are moving from outside the cell to move inside of the cell. Or in the case of the um, blue squares, they're moving from inside the square outside. Now, in either situation, we've actually got a solute, like this one, moving from an area of low concentration, where there's very little of the solute. Sorry for the spelling error right there. Okay, to an area of higher concentration, where there's lots of solutes. See all the solutes right there? And then there's very few on the outside. Now, we said before when we talked about the gases in the previous video on free energy that things like to move from high concentration to low concentration. And so these solutes are moving the opposite way. All right, so in order to move from a low concentration to a high concentration, that actually requires an input of energy. Moving from low to high requires an increase of free energy, so it's greater than zero. That means that it's not going to happen spontaneously. It won't happen on its own. So in order to do this, the cell needs to provide energy from somewhere. And where it gets that energy is a different reaction, changing ATP to ADP, adenosine triphosphate, into adenosine diphosphate. Now, turning ATP into a DP releases energy. It has a delta G that is less than zero. So energy is released from this transformation, and the energy that's released is used to power this reaction, used to pull solutes into the cell that wouldn't go there normally. And this is how a lot of things inside cells work. If you want to move something where it doesn't want to go, or if you want to store energy, we usually couple that with a different reaction that releases energy in order to make the situation possible, in order to move things where they wouldn't otherwise go. This is how the chemistry of all living things occurs. Another example of living things using energy in order to accomplish a different purpose is the idea of being an endotherm versus being an ectotherm. I'm not sure if you can see that ectotherm right there. We have other names for this. Endotherm we usually call warm-blooded and ectotherm we usually call cold-blooded. So the difference between these is that an ectotherm does not use reactions within the body in order to create heat. Whereas, so it's kind of dependent on what the temperature is, and you can see that in this graph. If, it's, if the ambient temperature, the outside temperature of the environment, is low, then the body temperature of the snake is also going to be low. So 10 and 10. The body temperature is about the same as the ambient temperature. Whereas for the bobcat, the bobcat keeps about the same body temperature no matter what the ambient temperature is. And the way he does that is he uses energy from mo metabolism of 
basically transformations like turning ATP into ADP or turning breaking sugars down into CO2 in cellular respiration in order to do nothing other than generate heat. And so these are all energy releasing reactions. They have a low negative delta G. And the energy that's released is released in the form of heat and it keeps the bobcat warm. Obviously that means that when it's colder outside, the bobcat needs to use more energy to keep warm. Whereas when it's warmer, it uses less energy to keep warm. This is a really, really energy intensive process. The bobcat uses a lot of its energy just to stay warm. To give you an example, um, not with bobcats and snakes, but with humans and crocodiles. The average human, the average adult human, and the average adult crocodile weigh about the same. Or actually, sorry, I should say alligator. The average adult alligator have about the same weight. But because humans are warm blooded, we require about 2,000 calories from our food every single day. We use 2,000 calories of energy and turn it into heat every day to keep our body running. An alligator that's the same size as a human but doesn't use energy for heat will use on average 60 calories every day. This is why alligators don't, when you go to the zoo, they don't usually move around a lot and they don't need to eat very much. It's because you are using the vast majority of your energy in order to simply keep yourself warm as opposed to um, actually using it to do the things that you do each day. All right, so because of this, we can talk about situations called energy balance. Remember that we've always got inputs of energy and you've always got outputs of energy. Like we were just talking about, energy that is outputted is going to be output first of all as heat and sometimes we use that heat to keep ourselves warm um, or it can be done for work like going and running a mile. That would be an output of energy. Input would be ways that you get energy, like food, or if you're a plant, light, or sometimes a, some types of bacteria can get it from certain chemicals in the environment. Now, we always want input to equal the output. If it doesn't equal the output, you've got one of two situations. If input is greater than output, that leads to energy storage. So if you're a human, you store energy as fat. And also you can use that energy to build muscle and do all kinds of other things. So if you actually are eating more food than you need each day, your body's going to store that somehow. It's either going to get taller or build more muscle and get stronger or store more fat and get fatter. Um, if, on the other hand, energy input is lower than energy output, then we're going to have a situation where you're actually losing body mass. You're going to lose fat, or you're going to lose muscle, or you're not going to be able to um, grow and develop. And eventually, if you lose enough body fat, you end up actually in a situation of starvation and death because the input of energy was too little to balance out the outputs. All right, the last thing we want to talk about is the idea of a food pyramid. And one of the things that's interesting about a food pyramid is, first of all, it shows you the amount of energy at each level and how energy moves. So the plants, the grass in this case at the bottom, they're what we call producers. They're the only ones that are able to make energy on their own, and they make it by absorbing light energy. When the plants get eaten by these insects, by these grasshoppers, those grasshoppers are called consumers because they're consuming the producers and taking their energy. But here's something that's really crazy. That energy transfer is not perfectly efficient. You could have, if you have, for example, a thousand calories of energy that is stored by 
the grass. The grasshoppers that eat the grass will only receive 10%. This is the 10% rule. They will receive only 10% of the energy from the grass they ate. So if the grass had stored 1,000 calories, they only receive 100 calories. And then when these um, rodents go ahead and eat those grasshoppers, they become the secondary consumers because they're consuming consumers. And they only receive 10% of that energy. So the grass had 1,000 calories. The grasshoppers are only going to get 100 calories. And the rodents are only going to get 10 calories. And then finally, when they get consumed by a tertiary consumer, you could go even higher than that, but usually it doesn't. Um, that's only going to receive one calorie. So one of the things that's amazing about this is, this is why grasshoppers and grass are super common. You find them everywhere because they're producers or primary consumers, whereas owls are really rare. Because in order to have one calorie for the owl, you need to have a thousand calories worth of grass in that same environment. And so as we move up the food chain, there's going to be less and less available energy. And if you get rid of one of these levels, obviously that damages the other levels even more. This is why we usually only have about three levels to each food chain, because there's so much loss of energy. If something were to go ahead and eat the owl, it's going to get even less of the energy, and it becomes even less efficient, and at some point, it becomes pretty pointless. And you might wonder, well, where is the energy going? If the owl eats this rodent and only gets a tenth of the energy, well, all the rest of the energy that gets lost is lost as heat back into the environment. And that heat energy can't be used by living things. It has to be replenished by bringing more energy in from light by the producers. One last note. The best reason I ever heard to become a vegetarian has to do with this. Because vegetarians only eat producers, they are very efficient at taking the limited amount of light energy that enters the world and bringing it to themselves. They receive 10% of the energy from those plants. But if you are eating meat, if you're eating, you know, let's say, beef, you're, eating, you're getting your energy from an animal that already got its animal from a producer. Instead of being a primary consumer, you become a secondary consumer. So now, you need, there needs to be, you're actually ultimately using 10 times as much energy as you would if you were purely a vegetarian just because it's a less efficient way for you to eat. And as the human population gets bigger and bigger and food becomes scarcer and scarcer, more of us may have to turn to this kind of lifestyle just because the Earth only has so much energy in the first place.